All right, welcome. We gotta get started. I got more pages than I did last week, so <laughs> it, it got longer. No, I added some to it and then I uh, got to the point where it got long enough. I was like, well, I could add a little bit more and make it two lessons, but then I ran out of time, so. We still might get two. Yeah, I still might get two just by not getting through it. All right, good morning, welcome. So today we are doing a lesson entitled From DNA to Galaxies, dealing with the teleological arguments. So I have Romans chapter 1, you can read it in your Bible or I have it printed there for you, Romans 1, 18 through 20. Word of God says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So we looked a little bit at this last week, right at the end, when we looked at some of the implications of the cosmological argument and what we can know about the Creator just by looking at that argument. And that, I believe, is the essence of what this verse is talking about, is when we look at God's creation, we can see certain things about Him, uh, attributes He has, talking about even His eternal power and Godhead, His divinity, knowing that He is beyond the created world. So, introduction. Last week we looked at the cosmological argument for the existence of God and its implications. Today we'll be looking at another argument type, the teleological. Simply stated, the teleological or teleo is the argument that design implies a designer. The fact that the universe is bursting with the signs of design points to a supreme engineer. Today I would like to talk about several touch points for design. We will begin looking at intelligent design and some of its subcategories. So Intelligent design is its own branch of teleological arguments. It's gaining a lot of traction in the uh, natural sciences, especially anything dealing with life. Uh, biology, botany, anatomy, physiology, anything dealing with living organisms. Intelligent design is becoming a very powerful, very large voice over the last 20 to 30 years. So, point two under introduction. After years of Darwinian evolution being the only option in biology, a new and growing school of thought has emerged. Intelligent design named this for the idea that <clears throat> what we observe in biology is too complex and organized to be, a random, to be random and therefore must have been designed. Things appear to have purpose and the probability of it happening by chance is mathematically impossible. As you can expect, it doesn't sit well with naturalists and their true colors come out. Darwinist Richard Lewitton once said, quote, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of its patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill man <coughs> of its uh, extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment to naturalism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a, mater a material explanation of a phenomenal world, but, on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori adherence to a material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and to set in a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the unindated, moreover, that materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. <laughs> that is the essence of naturalism right there. This is why when we look at these things and we wonder we go back to one of my earlier studies on the perplexities. This is why the perplexities, because they cannot allow God. So no matter how crazy it sounds, they have to go with it. Not because that's where the science leads them, not because that's where the facts lead them, but they cannot allow there to be a God touching science. So they got to make up something to fill that gap. 
So there is so much telling of the naturalists here. These men and women have a commitment to naturalism. This is a commitment that they will cling to despite evidence and proof that they are wrong. They will cling to the lie for the simple reason that they do not want to face the fact and that, that there was and is a creator of the universe. So what are some of these evidences and proofs that have the scientists chanting mantras as they hold their naturalist prayer beads? Many of them center on the teleological arguments. So, main point, teleological arguments. Probably the most famous teleo is William Paley's classic watchmaker analogy. The argument goes something like, one, the complex inner workings of a watch necessitate an intelligent designer. Two, as with a watch, the complexity of X, a particular organ or organism, the structure of the solar system, life, the universe, anything that is extremely complex, necessitates a designer as the natural processes could never account for it. So this is the idea, he said, if I was walking in the woods one day and happened along a nice, expensive Swiss watch, laying on the ground in the middle of nowhere where people don't normally go, I would never assume that that watch appeared there by natural processes. I know the inner workings of a watch. I know how the gearings work. I know how all the different components, the alloys that don't occur naturally, the different metals, the glass, everything coming together, how it has to be so precise, the hands, everything, that's not something that happens just by chance and appears in the woods. Somebody dropped it. That's how it got there or threw it or something. So, many atheists have attempted to take a stab at this analogy, and Dar Darwinian evolution and natural selection have largely been the anti-arguments to this. Richard Dawkins even wrote uh, <clears throat> The Blind Watchmaker to show how evolution answers this analogy. <laughs> this answer is that natural processes must have given the appearance of design and are mistaken as design. <laughs> In my opinion, they have fallen short of answering it, as I believe Darwinian evolution is all but dead. The coffin is being nailed shut as we speak by many brilliant and talented scientists who have all found themselves moored in the harbor of intelligent design and no longer under the boughs of Darwin's tree of life. So, you know, the best answer they have out there, if you guys are familiar with Richard Dawkins, he's one of what they call the four horsemen of the uh, new atheist movement. Very popular, best-selling, he's got, what, six bestsellers or something by now? Um, very prominent atheist, and that's the best answer they can come up with, with is that it looks designed, but it's not. <laughs> Just looks that way. It appears that way. So, irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. This is a, under the intelligent design movement, this is one of the big ones. Um, Michael B. He has done a lot of work in this area. So I have under that quote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Charles Darwin on the origin of the species. So Charles Darwin, when he wrote it, I have underneath, Darwin himself was at least honest about his lack of knowledge. His theory was based on now on now over 150 year old technology and scientific knowledge. He was bound to get things a little messed up. For scientists today to go on believing his theory without any question is ridiculous as James Gills and Tom Woodward state in the introduction to their book, Darwin, Darwinism Under the Microscope. So they say, quote, Darwinism can no longer be granted a relaxed acceptance as it, is, as it was for nearly all of the 20th century. A new century has opened with nearly every aspect of Darwinism, every one of its branches, every line of its thoughts, under an intense scrutiny never before experienced. This is a healthy development and long overdue because an unexamined science tends to decay into a lazy, unaccountable caricature of science, one that substitutes suppositions and speculations for rigorous explanation. So what's happened is once Darwin came out and published, the world accepted it by storm. This was finally one of the big breaks to get rid of God and science and just accept something else. 
They took it to heart, especially in Europe for a long time. It blew up in Europe before it finally came over to America. If you're aware of the Scopes Monkey Trial, it finally came into the public arena here, trickled down, and it for most of the 20th century, it was left unanswered. Um, Scopes Monkey Trial really hit us Christians hard because it turned into a debate between science and theology, and theology was prepared to answer anything these scientists were saying. We looked like fools, and the world decided, well, if those are the best of Christians have to offer, they have no answers. So let's go with science. They have all the answers, it seems like. And largely, we lost the battle for many, many years, and it just became this silent, accepted you know, status quo that Darwinian evolution was how things happened, and nobody questioned it. So Darwinism held the first chair through the, throughout the 20th century, and Christianity or any form of creationism was not even allowed a voice in the academic world. Any opposition was silenced, and the person who stood for Christ was berated for their religious biases. Religion and science had separated and a hard line drawn in the sand. But much of this is being reversed due to the efforts of men like Michael Behe and his work in the area of irreducible complexity. So irreducible complexity is the idea that some organs and organisms are too complex to evolve. The irreducible part means that, you, that if you make only one slight modification to the organ or organism, it will die or not function. Michael Behe writes about this in his book, Darwin's Black Box. One example he gives, it's a great book. it is a good book, is the common mouse trap. A mouse trap has five essential parts. If you are missing one of them, it will not work. Everybody understands what a, a basic mouse trap is, right? With the old, the old school spring style. There's basically five parts to that. If you take away any one of those five parts, it will not catch mice, period. It's not going to do anything but sit there. So, you can build it one piece at a time, but it will not trap mice until all the pieces are present and in order. He goes on to explain that the intricacies of the cell and the flagellar motor, these are way more complex and need all their parts to function. No slow, successive model can account for them. Behe makes this analogy to show us that without one part, you won't catch half the mice or even a quarter. The trap will catch no mice, for it never can. Behe defines irreducible complexity as, quote, a single system which is composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Behe gives many examples of these sort of systems, two of which we will consider as naturalists have attempted to falsify them. So, the first is a, a bacterial flagellum. You guys remember back in biology class, you got basic cells, right? And cells, a lot of cells have different sorts of locomotion. They can move. You got ones that have, anybody remember what all these little hairs are that move them? Cilia. cilia. So that's a cilia and they're little whips and they act like oars. They all move together like oars. And then you have, what's that one? A flagellum. So a flagellum is a long whip-like tail that acts basically as an outboard motor. So, top of page four. The first is a bacterial, bacterial flagellum. This is a highly sophisticated outboard motor which can spin at 10,000 RPMs and in a quarter turn reverse to 10,000 RPMs. Anybody knows engines at all, can you run your car at 10,000 RPMs and then reverse it to 10,000 RPMs in reverse in a quarter turn of the crank or camshaft? Now, <laughs> the only thing you're going to see is all your pistons flying out of your, <laughs> either right out the bottom of your uh, engine or right out the hood. It's not going to happen. So this is the most sophisticated outboard motor on the planet. We can't even get close to replicating that. And it has 40 distinct protein parts that are all necessary to function. 
Behe argues that this is impossible to be explained by natural processes, but bears the distinguishing marks of a maker. So the idea is this takes at least 40 essential parts to run. I cannot take any of those 40 parts away and still have it run. Not at a half the speed or a quarter of the speed. It will not function. So the idea of natural selection and survival of the fittest is if I have an organism that has no locomotion and is now crippled by a non-working engine, they're going to die out and they're going to be weeded out of the gene pool because they're weak. I can't get that by slow successive changes. And they give dozens and dozens of examples of this. So he also gives an example of blood clotting system found in living animals and humans. So obviously we know a little bit about blood clotting. We know it evolve, involves many different uh, cells that all have to work together. Uh, essentially when we get cut, we have vessel constriction, the blood flow slows down. We have uh, new platelets running to the area, sealing up the wound. Then eventually that clot is formed, but that clot also has to be removed or you don't actually heal. You just have a big scab there forever. So there's, it's much more complex. There's a lot of working parts in that as well. So yeah, if you don't, and if you don't have enough or the right amounts, you either A, won't stop bleeding. Correct or the clot will become too big right. and cause a different problem. Right, and also then that works in the thing. Why do we do blood thinners? Because you get clots in your bloodstream and eventually you blow your brains out when it moves to your brain. You lower your blood pressure. Right. <laughs> So if, yeah, if all you ever do is form clots and never get rid of them, you're going to die. And if you never form clots, you're going to die. So that's the, so what is the response of naturalism back page four? So Barry Hall had a uh, experiment he did on E. coli that he says they evolved operon. The claim some make is his experiment is that, so he's not claiming this about his own experiment. Other people have read his experiment notes and then made these assertions about it. That subjugated to certain elements, the E. coli evolved new ability to use lactose for food. So basically what they were saying is if they took the E. coli, they put them in a Petri dish and only gave them uh, lactose, they would die. They couldn't metastasize it and use it as energy. They could do a very minute amount they could use. So what they had to do is he eventually had to do a whole lot of different stuff to them, but two strains emerged of E. coli and they both by different processes could use the lactose for food more effectively than they had before. So what people said is, see, that's a system that arose that now they use lactose better than they did before. So therefore you can slowly get these better things. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a minute. The next study is uh, by Bug. I don't know if it's Bug or Bug. I'm gonna say Bug. Bug et al, a research group but led by T.H. Bug. The experiment altered two groups of mice in regards to blood clotting. So they actually went in and they knocked out pieces of the genetic code in the, the mice. They knocked out the part for getting rid of clots in one group. They knocked out the part for getting clots in the other group. So one couldn't clot at all. The other couldn't get rid of its clot. So the experiment altered two groups of mice in regard to clotting. One could not clot, the other could not remove clots. When crossbreeding the two, the double knockouts were alleviated from some symptoms. So basically when they took these two different mice, one that couldn't clot, one that could, and they crossbred them, the offspring couldn't do either, remove or clot. And because of that, they didn't have some of the symptoms of one of the parents but all the symptoms of the other parents still. So people read that and said, aha, we've alleviated their problems. They could evolve this. So back to the notes, but why do they show a, nat a natural growth of a complex system? But do they show a natural growth of the complex systems? No, for several reasons. First and foremost, they were intelligently designed experiments. The whole point we're trying to get is that by a natural 
unintelligent process this stuff happened. So setting up an intelligent experiment is null and void right off the bay bag because now I have an intelligent person tampering with what we find trying to get a certain result. So any experiment I set up is automatically thrown out because I'm intelligent and I'm trying to accomplish something. I'm not an unintelligent process. Second, all subjects were doomed to extinction without constant intelligent tampering. The E. coli in the jar all would have died unless he introduced an artificial stimulus that kept them alive. That was the only way they actually could do this. He even admitted in his notes if he were to release them into the wild, they all would have died. So intelligent processes went in, intelligent processes had to aid them all along the way or they would die. Same with the mice. If I have these mice, I release them in the wild, they're all going to die off. Their mortality rate was astronomical, especially with the non-blood clotting, every female died if she got pregnant, obviously. Every male, you can't survive, so you're in a controlled environment with all the food, all the water, all the shelter, the correct temperatures, no natural predators, no fight for survival whatsoever, and they're still dying left and right. Now try to introduce those to the wild where they have all those things. You're never going to get a species that survives. None would survive in the wild. They were all in highly controlled environments. All had non-functioning systems, not partially functioning ones. The whole point was to show that this could be like a less effective clotting process or a less effective lactose process. The lactose one, they already had a process to use some lactose. It just got slightly better, but it would have killed them in the end. With the mice, they didn't have a clotting process. They just died because their blood would not clot properly or get rid of the clots. So what is the last gasp of naturalism against irreducible complexity? The last thing they have to say about it is that it can't be trusted because it's non-falsifiable. Basically, we can't prove it wrong, so it must be wrong. That's, that's basically what they're saying. Behe explains what this means. He says, quote, the danger of accepting an effectively unfalsifiable hypothesis is that science has no way to determine if the belief corresponds to reality. So it is something that we, we often do want to avoid if possible because, yeah, we have no way of saying this is actually how it is if it's non-falsifiable. The irony is that Darwinism is effectively unfalsifiable and not irreducible complexity as be he again states, quote, the claim of intelligent design is that no unintelligent process could produce this system. The claim of Darwinism is that some unintelligent process could produce this system. To falsify the first claim, so to falsify intelligent design, one need only show that at least one unintelligent process could produce a system. So that's what they tried to do with these, right? They tried to give one example, neither of them worked, but they tried, and that's all they would have to do. They would have to get one successful example and we, they could falsify it. That's all they gotta do, produce one. To falsify the second claim, one would have to show that the system could not have been formed by any of a potentially infinite number of possible unintelligent processes, which is effectively impossible to do. So for us to say that Darwinian evolution is absolutely not possible, they've taken this like safe room of saying you have to prove that an infinite amount of processes that we haven't even come up with yet are not possible. So anytime we say you're wrong because this, they say, well, hold on, wait 20 years, we'll come up with a new one. And then you'll have to deal with that one. And then you'll have to deal with the next one. And then you'll have to deal with the next one and on to infinity. So they claim they, you shouldn't trust intelligent design because it's non-falsifiable. The irony is that their theory is in fact unfalsifiable. You cannot deal with it because it's infinite. We can deal with each one as they come up and, and falsify each one as they come up with them, but until they come up with the next one, we can't falsify it. So, any questions on that section before we move on to design inference?
Okay. So design inference. Design inference is based largely, largely on Dembski's work. This basically is a mathematical formula that explains how humans distinguish design from naturally occurring phenomenon. The key components are recognizable patterns, complexity, and probability of natural occurrence. According to his theory, the complexity and probability of biological life is not possibly explained by natural causes and must therefore be designed. This gave scientists a much needed formula that could be used as a filter between naturally occurring phenomenon and truly designed ones. This is how we tell an artifact from a rock, i.e. an arrowhead. So when you're walking along, we, we can see an arrowhead and a rock sitting side by side and we recognize one is a tool and one is just a rock. This gives us a mathematical filter for why do we see that when we look at things. So an example would be, if you see a rock formation on vacation and it looks like a face and the guide tells you it was eroded by wind and water and just appears to look like a face, upon further inspection from a different angle, you see that he is right. Now fast forward to the part where you get to Mount Rushmore on the tour. If the tour guide tells you the same thing, would you believe him? Obviously not. Because no one in their right mind would think that the faces of four U.S. presidents would, random, would be randomly etched into the side of a mountain by water and wind. Yet scientists have made ast astronomically larger assertions in saying that all the biological life we see around us is just a product of time, chance, and natural processes. Everybody understand that? You get that. When you see something, you know, this goes back to... Uh, Pele's you know, watchmaker thing. Now this is taking the math into it. Why do we see that watch as designed? And there's a mathematical formula that's actually behind that, that we're wired to see design. So when we see Mount Rushmore, we know that it is not probable that that would occur. We know that it's way too complex and it's a recognizable pattern. We can see the presidents and we can either remember from history classes their pictures and books or on currency or whatever else. We know that pattern. We know it's complex and it's not going to happen by wind and water. So anthropic constants and fine tuning. Top of page six. Anthropic principles. Anthropic principle comes from the Greek word meaning human or man. This is the argument based on the mounting evidence that the universe was designed very specifically to support human life. So many, law, so many laws and constants affect humans, many specifically that it is beyond comprehension that it could ever be possible without design. So what this basically is saying is that there are things in the universe that are tuned in such a way that if they were not that way, humans would never be able to live in this universe. <coughs> many of them affect humans specifically, many of them affect all life. So some examples from Geisler and Turek's books, book, I don't have a faith, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist are. One, Earth's oxygen level. It's at 21%. If it's higher than 25 or lower than 15, we die. The atmospheric transparency. Any higher, we would be microwaved. Any lower, we would not get enough sunlight. Either way, we die. Moon Earth gravitational interaction. Any more or less mass chaos in tidal and weather, life would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. CO2 levels, any higher we burn, lower we suffocate. Gravity, if gravity were altered, and you see that number there, I'm not gonna to attempt to say it, but it's a lot of zeros, point zeros, one percent, the sun could not exist. That one's crazy, just altering the force of gravity, that amount would not allow for the sun to actually hold together and it would be gone. All stars would just float apart. So they go on to list 10 more like this and state that there are at least 120 examples that have been given. So this amount of precision is not possible in the least, not for all of them or even a couple. 
Yet they all had to happen with this amount of exactness for our lives to be here. Obviously, naturalism is grossly lacking in explanations department. You know, they have over 120 examples that if things are just slightly changed, human life is gone. You know, this shows that the universe as a whole and Earth specifically, our solar system, all that kind of stuff is so finely tuned and so finely designed to support human life that there's no way that sort of thing can just happen by random chance. Not that many. I mean, not even one is impossible enough, not 120 plus or whatever they come up with in the future. Any questions on anthropic principles? I was just thinking of that uh, last section there on, in relation to the, you know, the thing of climate change and global warming mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, they're so fearful that we're going to bring something out of out of balance right. to the point where we're going to all be extinct. Right. But. That would seem to be an argument almost against their theory of of chance that right. this ought to happen. Right, it's so if, fragile. If we can force a change through our human conduct, then then uh, why can't evolution or whatever they say that behind it correct it? Right. Why wouldn't it just naturally correct itself? Yeah versus us screwing it up. The other irony in that is that we're all doomed to die anyway. If things are left to themselves, the universe eventually will die. You know, so even correcting it now, yeah, we buy ourselves some time maybe, but for what? We're all doomed to eventual extinction anyway. <clears throat> okay, so information theory. So information theory is the theory that coded messages and language require an intelligent agent to write them. This is what SETI operates on. You guys are familiar with SETI? SETI is the taxpayer funded. Basically it's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's what SETI stands for and it's taxpayer funded. Basically what they do with SETI is they got a uh, big satellite dishes pointed up to the heavens, and they are sending out coded messages. Uh, one, three, five, seven, thirteen. You know, they're sending out prime numbers, patterns in math, mathematical patterns, basically out into space. And the hope is that if there is intelligent life in space, we will receive back a pattern, a mathematical pattern, because math is a universal language. You know, we may not speak the same language as the aliens, but they probably know math better than we do. So they're going to send mathematical patterns back at us, and we're going to get those mathematical patterns, and we'll know for a fact that there's intelligent life in the universe besides us because we have math coming back to us. So that's the theory. So they're sending out mathematical patterns and sequences in the hopes that they will be answered similarly. If a recognizable pattern returns, it is proof of intelligent life outside of Earth. So why does this matter? Because of the discovery of DNA. As we study it more and more, we learn that it is the very thing that allows life to exist. We classify all things as alive or not based on if it has DNA or not. That's how we classify living and non-living things in the world, in the universe. If it has DNA, it's a living thing. If it doesn't have DNA, it's not a living thing. So, what is DNA? DNA is a highly structured and organized language or code that specifies every detail of the living cells. It is a building instructions and manufacturing specifications. Where did this vast amount of information come from? Information is not a physical thing, although DNA is. The order must be exactly correct or no life is possible. So how does a highly specified set of assembly instructions just pop into order without someone tampering? Why would it be proof of aliens if the same thing came from space, but because we already have proof of intelligence in our cells, is it ruled out? That's what I can't understand. This is proof of intelligent life. We already have that in our every one of your cells in your body, 
but it's not intelligent. That was a random process because I already, I'm already familiar with it. So it's me, it's, it's random. That's life. <laughs> so to illustrate this, if you were walking on a beach and you came upon a note in the sand, that sand reading, take out the trash, John, you would never assume that the tide came in and out and the waves and the crustaceans just happened to leave trails in the sand that spelled out that message. Yet we are expected to take the scientists' word when they say that a highly specified message is contained in every cell, which is equivalent to many large volumes or messages, came into order, came into the order that they are by similar natural causes. But they don't even believe this, as they know information from space would be intelligence. This point cannot be overstated. Information cannot evolve or pop into existence. It's non-physical. It doesn't come from physical processes. Even if there were natural processes that evolved us, information cannot come from that. Only a mind can comprehend it, and only a mind can conceive it. The method used to write it changes nothing. I can type it, scrawl it in crayon, arrange objects, use pen or pencil. The information content stays the same. The letters H-E-L-P in order, made with logs and rocks on a beach, tell us someone is in need of aid, not that the tide made a random pattern. The content behind the letters. You could find letters out of trees and branches and stuff like that randomly. Maybe a cloud looks like an H or something like that. But we know that when you get that pattern, H-E-L-P, in order, there's information behind those now. They're not just a random letter. They have an informational content. Someone needs aid somewhere. That's essentially what this theory says. We, we look at the DNA found in every cell and we see highly specified, very lengthy, highly specified paragraphs, pages, books, volume after volume in these DNA that give all the assembly instructions for living organisms. That can evolve. That can't come from a process. That has to come from a mind. Does everybody understand that? Any questions on that? Yeah, don't let somebody get away with saying SETI proves there's aliens, but DNA doesn't prove God. Can't, it's the same theory. One, one thing with, with DNA, the cancer is, is a corruption of the DNA, right? Correct. So, so if it's a mutation, it wasn't good. Yes, and 99.9% .9 of all mutations are bad. Yeah. Alright, response of naturalism. So, how does, how does naturalism respond to a lot of these teleological arguments? So we have holes in evolution. Take your time, take a chance. How many worlds would you like, sir? Traditionally, scientists have answered the critics saying that given enough time and chances, life would eventually rise, and given enough time and chances again, it would eventually end up with us. Well, just how much time would it take? So, for life to arise, top of page 8, for life to arise by natural causes, the experts say that even a simple life to arise in 5 billion years is 1 in 10 to the 10 to the 110th power. Literally impossible, but hey, who's counting? So, even in 5 billion years, life to arise, even in a simple, is impossible. So, to evolve to us, Carl Sagan estimates 1 in 10 to the 2 billionth power. Um, I was going to do something, but my wife took all our quarters and changed back to the, um, <laughs> the bank this week because I didn't tell her I was going to do this. I'm going to give everybody a quarter and have you guys all start flipping them. What are the odds that anybody in this room gets to 100 heads in a row? It's not going to happen. But every time you flip it, what are your odds? 50-50. I got a 50-50 every time I flip it. So, no one is going to dare. What I would assume would be is some of you would fail right away and get 
tails on the first flip. Some of you might get heads once, maybe twice, maybe one or two people might get to three or four. Nobody's getting to 100, I can guarantee it. So then if you, if you take that and say, okay, nobody can get to 100, you know, we could expand this group to 1,000 people. I guarantee you nobody's getting to 100 in that group. But say we can. Say we can get to uh, the odds of this happening, what, what Carl Sagan is estimating here would be beyond this, but I'm just going to put it in smaller because we don't understand numbers as big as 10 to the 2 billionth power. <laughs> so to put it in smaller numbers we can understand, say we would have to get not 100 in a row, but 10 or 100,000 heads in a row. That's our odds. We've got to get 100,000 heads in a row. Now, that's for, say, we'll just put out one mutation to be good to pass on to the next generation. From the first life to us, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of mutations that would have to happen. So now my 100,000 coin tosses in a row turn to one, and I gotta do that 100,000 more times just to get to us. I mean, that's way lower than the odds of what he's saying happening. But you, anybody can see it's not gonna happen. Even just getting 100,000 in a row is never gonna happen. So this goes back to that possible, probable, actual, mathematically, theoretically possible, but in the actual world, not possible. So, here the experts say, yeah, the odds are seemingly insurmountable, but we have all the time and chances we need, don't we? Uh, so back when I was a kid, they were still teaching and saying eons and eons and eons and eons and eons ago. They basically just had the, this open-ended universe that had an infinite past, which we looked at last week, is impossible. But the idea was we have all the time we need for these chances to happen. Doesn't matter how much time you have, those chances are not gonna happen in this universe. But, do they actually have that much time? No, because sadly for them, modern cosmology has redated the universe at only 13.7 billion years old. Well, I said years young, because to them that's years young. 13.7 uh, billion years is not enough time for any of their stuff to happen, let alone go from the Big Bang to us is not even on the scope anymore. So they're really sad about this. They don't like this at all. But those are the implications of modern cosmology. So <clears throat> this is a huge beyond huge cut from the previous estimates and has caused severe trauma to the, naturalist, to the naturalism camp. This is because they no longer have all the time in the world but only a few precious billion years, which means the odds are now truly impossible with so short a time. So add in irreducible complexity and the gaps in the fossil record, which was another issue Darwin was aware of, but thought that paleontology would eventually catch up with his, with his theory, it never did. Um, and what do you get? You get a new model of evolution with almost as many problems as the original. This new model is necessary because even the naturalists can see the growing issues with Darwinian evolution. Naturalists such as Richard Dawkins go as far as saying that the natural processes give the appearance of design, but they are in fact not design. They believe this is the answer to the teleological argument. So this new model, so this is, once we put in the probability, once we put in everything else, they really had to backtrack. Now we have to come up with a new model. This can't work, all right? What we were saying before, it doesn't work. We know it doesn't work, so we gotta come up with something new. So what they came up with is called punctuated equilibrium, or the hopeful monster theory. In short, it states that the reason there is no transitional forms is because evolution happened by quick leaps. Basically, a, la a lizard laid an egg and a bird popped out. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously it's more complicated than that, but that's essentially what they're saying. The reason you don't find transitional species in between is because the mutations happened very quickly and a new species was born overnight with no transitions. So this theory has, as, has many of the same problems like where, <coughs> like where did the DNA come from? 
Obviously, if I'm gonna go from a lizard to a bird, there's a lot of differences in the DNA. I need that information from somewhere. If that can evolve, where did it come from? How probable is that, that many mutations were beneficial and genetic? That's to say, what I mean by that is, one, beneficial to the species, doesn't cripple them, doesn't render them incapable of functioning, and genetic as far as they can actually pass it on to their offspring because that also has to happen. Even if I get a good mutation, if I can't pass it on, it does no good to the evolutionary process. Three, how did first life arise? We just looked at the probabilities. They still don't even attempt to answer that question. This fixes nothing. We still have to have life for even this theory to apply to. Four, what came first, the milk or the womb? <laughs> So this is that chicken or the egg, and I put it as milk or the womb, because this one, I was thinking about it. Uh, say, even though against all odds, life arises by natural chances. We looked at the chances of that happening, but we'll give them it. We'll give them that life arose completely by chance. We'll just give it to them for sake of argument. All right, so this little amoeba-ish thing is floating around in his pool. He comes into life, spark of electricity, Frankenstein kind of thing, whatever, comes into existence. He has to have, or it, it has to have certain things in place automatically for it to survive. Just because it came into existence in life in this soup does not mean it can survive in that soup. So we have to say that this amoeba popped into existence or came alive and it had every capacity to remain alive. So that means, does anybody remember on a cell, what is this wall around the outside? A membrane. A membrane. So they, this amoeba has to come into life with a functioning membrane that is selectively permeable, does not allow bad stuff in, but gets rid of its own bad stuff. So it's gotta have a membrane. Just so happens by chance he popped into life with a working membrane. Two, anybody who's ever been on a diet, what do you count when you're trying to lose weight? Calories. What essentially are calories? Energy. Energy. Without them, you die. So he has to come into existence, into life with all the necessary stores of energy to function. If he doesn't have enough energy, he would just die before he ever has a chance to reproduce. So he needs energy. Um, in a closed system, what happens to energy? It goes down, decreases until it runs out, just like us. Our energy winds down. That's why we got to eat. That's why we got to drink. That's why we got to sleep. We got to have all kinds of systems to metastasize food or whatever into chemical energy. So, even if he came into existence with a whole bunch of energy, that doesn't mean he's going to survive. He has to have an ability to create more energy out of his environment. So now he has to produce energy. Okay, um, he popped into existence, he's all alone. If he wants offsprings, what has to happen? Well, it's kind of a miracle. He has to have something that, uh, yeah. Maybe well, we're, we're gonna, gonna we're gonna assume, he needs a mate. right, we're gonna assume he reproduces asexually. Yeah, that can happen. He has to, there, there's no, he has no mate. So just so lucky for him, he popped into existence with all the necessary things to uh, reproduce asexually by himself. Again, that goes back to this energy thing. To produce another living organism, you need a vast amount of more energy. So he has to have all that in place. So if I'm going from that, fast forward to me, there are some very big differences between him and me. When I, at what point, at some point, this has to go away. At some point, these change. At some point, I go from being a single cell to a multi-cell. But what I had to assume here is, what happens when you get uh, symbiotic relationships where it's necessary, like a mother and a child? Going from that to a human, and I'm aware of this because we're about to have our third child, 
I know that there are innate abilities for women to actually produce food that is necessary for their babies and their babies have to have a desire to suck. One has to give suck, one has to suck. That has to be there in both the mother and the offspring. That's intelligence. Right. So a natural process says I'm going from this to a relationship now with, with parent and, and offspring that they both the child is completely 100% contingent and necessary to have that parent. How do you get that? With this theory, it says, okay, well, a chicken, you know, a lizard laid an egg, a chicken popped out. Well, then what happens when you get to the point of needing milk? So the offspring, the baby, needs milk, but the mother doesn't produce milk yet. It dies. What happens to that species? It dies. Out. It dies. What happens if the mother produces milk, but the baby doesn't need it? Why would she be producing milk when a baby doesn't need it? It doesn't make any sense why you would produce a system that's completely useless, um, especially given how natural selection works. It expends a lot of energy. If you know anything about breastfeeding, it burns a lot of calories. That's bad because that kills you if you burn too many calories. That's why you atrophy when you work out a lot, you go to bed, your body automatically attacks your muscles. Why? Because they're burning too many calories and we're going to die. So, that means that these genetic mutations had to occur simultaneously too. Not just that they had to pop into existence randomly, the information had to come from nowhere, they also had to do it cross generation at the same time. The mother had to all of a sudden produce the ability to give suck. The baby had to all of a sudden need it and want it in the same generation. It can't skip three or four else the species would have died off. This is even uh, compounds the problem even more. So even giving them all that impossibilities, you're not out of the, you're not out of the woods just because we give them all that. As they come down, there are many examples like that that just, it can't happen. Not to mention that, that's not gonna happen in the first place. <clears throat> so, the naturalist, bottom of page eight, the naturalist must maintain that their only defense is that it merely looks, sounds, smells, tastes, feels, and appears like things are designed, but they really aren't, believe us. Conclusion. After surveying these arguments thus far, I would hope you have come to see, as I have, that the experts are horribly lost and confused. Satan has truly blinded their eyes, and their own hearts have they hardened to the truth. It is saddening, maddening, and frustrating to see them flounder with their own existence. That is why apologetics is so important. We must do all we can to help them break free and accept the gospel with mind and soul, Remember one day we will stand in judgment before a holy God. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5.11a I think that's about all the time we got. Have we got any questions following up? You got two lessons left or three? I have, gonna... I have, I'm working, I have one more written, two more written. A third one I'm writing for, I don't know, I got a few left yet, actually, why? I just was curious what you thought your time frame was as far as... Um, I think I have five left. Five left? Well... Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a point on, you know, we, we, we call them scientists, the evolutionists, but that's not science. Correct. But, you know, I mean, we, we, it's science falsely so-called, right? Because it isn't science. They're not scientists, and so we say it's science versus religion. No, right. they're not, it's not science. Right. We call it science, scientism. Right. It's religion versus religion is what it is. Exactly. It's right. a different religion. Yeah. Um, they're still doing science. A lot of these guys are biologists and botany and everything else, but when they come to the, the questions of, well, how did this happen? Where did this come from? That's where their religion of naturalism takes over and the science goes out the door.